Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about the word coach and the history of education over rather a long stretch of the Western educational world. First, though, as always, we have a couple of things to do. So thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, Giorgio. We really appreciate, as always, all the support we're being given. And we would encourage anyone who would like to help out to go over to patreon.com slash the endless knot. And you can see what the rewards are for each tier and we really do thank every single person who's able to contribute and if you're not but you're listening and you can spread the word about the podcast that is also something we really appreciate thanks again so once again we're going to feature a promo from the humanities podcasters group so take a listen and see if this is one you might want to add to your listening list if you like this podcast you might be interested in other podcasts that focus on the humanities in fact, if you search Twitter for the hashtag Humanities Podcasts, you'll find plenty of shows on history, language, literature, philosophy, art, and more. These are podcasts by people who enjoy telling stories, exploring the arts in our world, and who want to share their knowledge. Some examples of the podcasts you'll find are Myth Take, focusing on Greek mythology, The Feast Podcast, which talks about great meals in history, or The Lonely Palette, an art history podcast. Search hashtag Humanities Podcast today or follow Humanities Podcasters on Twitter. And if you're a Humanities Podcaster, use the hashtag in your tweets so others can find you. Thank you, Emily, from the Story Behind Podcast for putting those promos together. Next, on to cocktails. So as I said, we're going to be talking about the word coach, but probably we're also going to be talking much more about issues of the changing face of education in Western Europe. So Mark, is there a tie into your cocktail? There is definitely a tie into my cocktail. So I'm having an old fashioned cocktail, not to say that I'm in some way championing old fashioned education. That would be sort of off brand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, the old fashioned cocktail was at least said to have been invented at the Pendennis Club, which was named after the novel Pendennis by Thackeray, which is the first occurrence in print of the verb to coach in its figurative sense of to coach uh, academically. Right. That is mentioned. Yeah, in... And that is mentioned in the in, in the video. So. Right. So I should say that what we're going to be doing talking about today is the voiceover from a video that you put out last year, I think. No, no? two years two ago. Two years ago now. Yeah. Okay. In fact, almost exactly two years. Oh, all right. In the course of which you will mention that derivation of the newer use of the word coach. That's right. All right. So your old fashioned is nicely tied to the <laughs> to the topic of the podcast. Mine's not. I don't like uh, old fashions because I'm not a big whiskey fan. Mm. So I didn't want to have one of those. And I spent a disturbingly long amount of time this evening as we were eating dinner and after dinner watching Puss in Boots, looking up every variation of things that were in this video and the word cocktail recipe, <laughs> trying to find something that would be thematically appropriate. And I could find almost nothing. I found one thing that was quite appropriate, but it required Malibu rum which is that coconut flavored rum. Mm. First of all, we don't have it in the house. And second, I'm not having it in the house. I don't <laughs> like it. So I didn't want to buy it for this. So See, I, now we can't have them as a sponsor. I'm really okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as we know, they were all beating down the door, those <laughs> flavored rum companies to sponsor us. So what I decided to do, well, as Mark made his old fashioned, I stood there flipping through the cocktail book, trying desperately to think of something that I wanted to have. And what I ended up settling on was a very old favorite of mine that I have not had in years called a toasted almond. And this is something I used to have way back in our old student days. So that's what I'm calling the tie-in. I'm saying that it's from when I was an undergrad. So it's uh, recalling my undergraduate days. But it's Kahlua and amaretto and cream. And it's very much a dessert cocktail. Unsophisticated, but very, very tasty ice cream in a glass, basically. <laughs> and I used to have that a lot. That was one of my favorite cocktails in days of yore. 
It occurs to me now the other thing you could have done is have really cheap, crappy wine because that's what they always serve at Academic Wine and Jesus. Well, I did suggest the sherry. The sherry, Which is yes, certainly my true. my memory of academically oriented sort of student-oriented things mm. at a very Anglican-inspired university undergraduate college was sherry. All mm. the time, the sherry. But I didn't want any sherry. <laughs> I don't mind sherry, but it you know, was not what I was in the mood for. But I'm happy with my dessert. So, so. we'll have our drinks. Cheers. Cheers. But replace that with a sound effect. <laughs> okay, so with that out of the way, why don't we turn immediately to listening to the voiceover for Coach, and then we can return and talk about issues that arise from it. Okay. Like all professional sports teams, the St. Louis Rams is overseen by a coach. But in the case of this team, the term is particularly appropriate. It all starts with the ancient Hungarian town called Coach, spelled K-O-C-S. The town name seems to come from the Hungarian word Kosh, which means ram, derived ultimately from a Turkic root of the same meaning. The coat of arms reflects this by including a picture of a ram, but it also shows the historical significance of this small Hungarian town by including the picture of a cart, or as we call them today from the name of the town, a coach. Coach, on the road between Budapest and Vienna, was part of the Imperial Postal Service connecting Hungary with the rest of Europe, bringing the kind of wagon invented in coach to wider attention. Originally referred to as a kochi sekir, meaning simply wagon from coach, this new type of carriage was fast and light. The speed and ease of travel made it appealing for men to ride in. They'd traditionally gone on horseback and left the slow carriages to women. And so the coach wagon really caught on, transforming the name of the town into a standard word for the vehicle, not just in English, but in all the European languages as well. In English, of course, we have the general term carriage, which comes from French and is related to the word carry, coming ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European word kers, meaning to run. This route produces quite a number of derivatives which have to do with running that make it into English, such as current, course, and career, originally a road for vehicles. It also gives us car from an old Celtic vehicle called the Caros, whose name was adopted by the Romans into Latin, which route then produces a number of French and English derivatives, not only car, but chariot too. And in referring to a wagon for carrying things, it has the additional sense of load or burden, leading to words such as cargo and charge. And, funnily enough, also caricature, in the sense of an exaggeration, or literally an overloading. But back to Coach. The rise of Coach seems to have come during the reign of Matthias Corvinus, who was king of Hungary from 1458 to 1490. Matthias was deeply into the new Renaissance learning. A real bookworm, he created a library, the Bibliotheca Corviniana, second in size only to the Vatican Library, and an inspiration to Lorenzo de' Medici in his own Greek and Latin library collection. And given that the whole Renaissance thing was kicked off by the Italians, Matthias was naturally a real Italophile, promoting Renaissance Italian art and scholarship in his kingdom. Matthias hobnobbed with many prominent Renaissance artists and intellectuals, including one Marsilio Ficino, who was really into Plato, and even set out to revive Plato's famous school, the Academy, with his own Florentine Academy. That word, Academy, by the way, comes from the sacred grove in Athens where Plato happened to teach his followers, a grove named after the Greek hero Akademos. And that's where we get the word academy, academia, and academic, as well as the modern Western conception of an institution of learning, like a university, all thanks to Plato. But back to Matthias Corvinus and Marsilio Ficino, who put the Hungarian king onto Plato, and in particular the idea of the philosopher king from Plato's book The Republic, that is, the theory that a philosopher makes the ideal king. Makes sense then that Matthias was so committed to learning. And since Matthias was such an Italophile, he married Beatrice of Naples, the daughter of King Ferdinand I, King of Naples from 1458 to 1494, and she encouraged Matthias in Italian Renaissance values. And it is in part through her that the coach, both the word and the vehicle, yes we're finally getting back to that now, made its way to the rest of Europe. Thanks to her marriage to Matthias, Beatrice's nephew Ippolito d'Este became an archbishop in Hungary. Upon returning to Italy around 1500, he brought a Hungarian coach back with him, along with a Hungarian driver, and shortly thereafter it became popular throughout the rest of Europe. So thanks to the King of Hungary's interest in academic learning, the coach makes its way to Western Europe. Its arrival there plays a part in a kind of transport revolution in the early modern period, but with more roads and more traffic than ever before. There was a new taste for fast transport by road for men, and not just for women or the aristocracy. And along the way there were various technological improvements to things such as suspension to provide a smoother ride. 
The later story of the coach, as well as other types of carriages, is one of continued technological development. For instance, in the 18th century Erasmus Darwin, grandfather of the famous Charles, and a physician who had to spend much of his time riding in coaches visiting his patients, invented an improved steering mechanism, now known as Ackerman steering, which would much later on be adapted for the steering mechanism of automobiles, and is still used today. Erasmus Darwin was a bit of a polymath with wide interests and pursuits, including his own proto-theory of evolution, cosmological speculation about the Big Bang, a design for a hydrogen-powered rocket, a mechanical bird, a speaking machine, a copying machine, and experiments with galvanism that inspired Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein. Further, like Mary Shelley's mother Mary Wollstonecraft, Darwin was a big supporter of education for women, writing his own book on the subject, perhaps motivated by the illegitimate daughters, both school teachers, he had by one of his mistresses, a governess. Make of that what you will. Interestingly, not wishing to patent his many inventions himself, to avoid tarnishing his reputation as a physician by seeming too greedy for money, he passed them on to others to develop. An open source pioneer? So how do we get from the development of transportation technology in the early modern period to the modern sense of coaching, like those St. Louis Rams I started with? Well, the answer is, it's a metaphor that developed in the early 19th century at Oxford University, bringing us back to academic institutions, the modern equivalent of Plato's Academy. Coach came to be used as a slang term for a tutor who metaphorically carries a student through an exam, in other words, helping him to get where he wants to be. The first recorded instance in the Oxford English Dictionary of the noun coach being used with this sense is in a poem written in 1848 by Arthur Clough, who had been an Oxford University student and, who in addition to writing poetry and being involved with educational matters, worked for a time as an unpaid secretarial assistant to the famous nurse Florence Nightingale. Clough's narrative poem, The Bothy of Tobernevwolich, features an Oxford University student as the main character. As a side note, Clough's sister Anne was a suffragette who promoted higher education for women and became the principal of Newnham College at Cambridge University, the other major academic institution in England along with Oxford. But anyway, the first recorded instance of the verb to coach in this sense is in the novel Pendennis by William Makepeace Thackeray, who is most famous for his novel Vanity Fair. The main character in the novel Pendennis is a student at a fictional college at the fictional university called Oxbridge, a portmanteau word made up by combining Oxford and Cambridge, which occurs for the first time in this novel. The name Oxbridge has since become a term to refer collectively to Oxford and Cambridge, the two oldest and most celebrated universities in England. And speaking of Cambridge, it was University of Cambridge chemistry professor William Farish who invented the numerically graded written examination in 1792. So if you find university exams stressful, you have Farish to thank for it. And it's because of these kinds of exams that we have the Oxbridge coaches, carrying students through them. And so, it's only a small step from academic coaches who help students through exams to athletic coaches who help athletes through competitions. In fact, the first reference to an athletic coach is in the sport of rowing, or crew, a sport famous for its rivalry between, you guessed it, Oxford and Cambridge universities, in their ever so creatively named annual competition, the Boat Race. The boat race was started in 1829 by Charles Merivale and Charles Wordsworth, nephew of poet William, friends and students at Cambridge and Oxford respectively. Oh, and they both study classics, which I suppose takes us back to Plato and ancient Greece. And so the word expanded to cover any athletic coach, including professional sports. But, as we know, athletics and university have continued to be connected. College football in the US is an obvious example. And did you know that the St. Louis Rams, back when they were formed in Cleveland in 1936, before moving to Los Angeles and finally to St. Louis, were named in honor of a university football team, the Fordham University Rams. The Fordham Rams can trace their own origin all the way back to 1882. Nowadays, the academic and intellectual origins of the word coach are mostly obscured by the sports-related meaning, which maybe isn't surprising given the way sports teams seem to overshadow academics at many universities these days. I wonder what Plato would say about that. So that's the story of Coach. Yeah, quite a wide-ranging, if compact, story there. And yet it all wends back to the topic on hand. Mm -hmm. It works nicely. So do you have anything you want to add just from your research that didn't get into it or anything else you want to put in? Yeah, a few other little points. Of course, this makes the word Coach a toponym. 
Right. Named, named after a place. Named after a place, which is probably not something that most people know about this. There are many famous toponyms, but mm-hmm. this is... That's is not an obvious one. Not an obvious one. Thackeray also coined the parallel word camphored instead of Oxbridge, so the opposite. Oh, right. Camford. Okay. Camford, yes. I was Cambridge, thinking parallel Oxford. to coach and I was confused. No, yes. Right. <laughs> parallel to Oxford, Oxbridge, Camford. Uh, right. But that one didn't catch on the same way, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I think that's that's all the extra details I have to, to add at this point. Okay. But what I wanted to continue with was just a discussion about education in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, I obviously end up with the sort of somewhat contentious position about that, you know, the role of athletics in the academic system. I don't know how contentious that would be. Well, to some, (laughs) perhaps. I don't know that it can be argued that it's not true. No. I suppose the only thing that would be contentious is whether you think it's a good or bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it does depend on the system. I mean, uh, athletics in general in Canadian universities... Is not as much of a problem. No. No. There probably are some issues at some universities, but in general, it is not where the funding goes to a public university in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I know from my colleagues in the U.S. that this is uh, an ongoing problem. Yeah, an ongoing point of, of, as you say, contention. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. But also the sort of future of education and in particular, you know, since this is an educational podcast Mm -hmm. and this was based on an educational YouTube video, the role of the Internet in Mm -hmm. uh, the future of education and and what what it can do and maybe what it can't do. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that a way of contextualizing that discussion a little bit would be to talk a bit about something which that video doesn't really get into which is the role of education and the purpose of education through Mm. the different periods. Because, Mm -hmm. I mean, in a sense, it is touched on by things like the discussion of the invention of the graded exams, for instance, and the idea of coaches and the idea of the philosopher king. I mean, all of those depend on particular conceptions of what the role of education is, what its purpose is. Mm. And this happens to be something that I was talking about just just last week in my Roman civilization class. We, I did a, my lecture on Roman education. Right. I had them take a moment to write down what the purposes of primary, secondary, and post-secondary education in Canada, mm. or in whatever systems they went through, since some were foreign students, were. Mm. And then... I asked them a further question, are there differences between the stated goals of those educational periods Mm. and perhaps unstated goals or pragmatic results? Like, is there a difference between what we say we do education for and the role it actually plays? Right. And then I turned to Roman education and talked about the purpose of education in Rome, especially for the elite classes, and we discussed Mm -hmm. how they did and didn't compare. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking about that issue of, you know, what are the reasons we do education? How do those change in different cultures and at different times? Who is the education aimed at? Who is given by? Mm -hmm. And what does that tell us, you know, about larger issues in in the culture? And also that question of why do we say we educate people But what is the actual result? And I think all of that is relevant to the future of education, obviously. Right. right. And to the question of does online education have a role and what is its role and what are its limitations? So I thought I'd start just very briefly by outlining then what that ancient classical purpose was, because that does come into this question of Plato's Academy. Yep. And leaving aside primary education, let's focus mostly on university level education. That's what we're most most interested in. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, post-secondary, overlapping with secondary, perhaps, education, because those come at different periods for different countries even now. Right. In Athens, which is our best Greek source for educational matters, education was, of course, the purview of the elite. Mm-hmm. It was not, there wasn't, well, first thing, there was no public education. So there was no publicly state-funded education. Yeah. And now that is, you know, that's a point to make because, for instance, at Sparta, there was an essentially a publicly funded state education. But that's because kind Sparta of the was weird. I guess. Yeah, yeah. It was because Sparta was weird. So it isn't a given that there wasn't, but there wasn't. So if there was education to be done, it was done by families. And when you're talking about the second, the sort of equivalent of post secondary, obviously those stages didn't exist, but the higher levels of education in the fifth century, you start getting sophists who are essentially roving philosophers who will teach groups of boys, of uh, young men, for a fee. And mainly what they taught was rhetoric. Rhetoric, logic, and philosophy, which are very overlapping fields in the ancient world. The art of speech making, 
the art of argument, the art of logical reasoning to the end of being able to make better speeches and be more persuasive, and then sometimes uh, philosophical debate and discussion. And the sophists, there was no particular school of sophists. And then we have people like Socrates, mm -hmm. famously, who did not like the sophists, but in the eyes of many people was the same as the sophists. So in Aristophanes' The Clouds, Socrates is lumped in with the sophists as people who go around teaching young men how to argue with their betters. Right. with their fathers right, and to make specious arguments and to be able to argue both sides of an argument just as easily. This was regarded by, with suspicion by some because the idea was, well, shouldn't the morally right argument be stronger? And if you can make the morally weak arguments just as strong, that's a threat to the fabric of society, essentially. Right. But at the same time, it was a mark of elite education and elegance to do this kind of advanced education. So, you know, what was the purpose of education? It was to get better at something that was important, that was to become a better public speaker, which was an important role of the elite at Athens, to be a good speaker in the Democratic Assembly and to be good in the law courts. And it was to show off the level of your education. And it would also allow for literary production if you wanted, though that wasn't necessarily a mark of the elite at the time. Right. So that's Athens. And then... We move into the fourth century with Plato hmm. and Aristotle following on Plato and that progression where we have a focus on learning as philosophy, love of wisdom, yep. and philosophy focuses on, in that period, to a large extent, some of it is a sort of natural science, Aristotelian and Theophrastus looking into natural science, but most of it's focused on what is the good, what is morally right, what is morality, what is the happy life. Hmm. Right. So self-improvement, essentially. And Plato's Republic with his philosopher King, the idea is that the philosopher is the man who has spent the most time looking for and finding the answers to the question of what is good hmm. and therefore should rule because he has found that answer. So he will have the, the wisdom, the knowledge of what the best life is for the state. So education then, in that ideal conception anyway, is for the improvement of the community. Right. For the improvement of the leadership of the community. If you improve the leaders of the community, you improve the community. There was nothing in Plato's Republic, in his ideal utopia, about educating the masses, for instance. There was no purpose in that. You would educate some people, the elite, and they would be educated and that would make the community strong. But you wouldn't educate the laborers or the soldiers. There was no purpose to that. Okay. So that's the world's most simplified vision of <laughs> education in Greek. In Rome, it's not that dissimilar, right? So education is focused on literacy at the lower levels and then uh, achievement of rhetorical competence at the middle levels. And then at the highest levels on rhetorical mastery, hmm. high level performance in public speaking, persuasive rhetoric, display rhetoric. And then the real post-secondary would be going off to Athens and studying in one of those philosophical schools to do that year or two abroad at Athens. There's lots of parallels to sort of the grand tour grand or tour. something like that. It was also in many ways like going to university. Yeah. You went off, you spent two years studying in Athens in a particular circle, like you chose your philosopher and you studied with them. And then you came back known as a follower of that philosopher and with the friendships you made among the peer group there and you'd been away and you came back ready to plunge into Roman politics. It was something that families would do to show that they could. Right. right? It was a marker of snobbery. I'm sure many of the boys sent off to school at Athens were not particularly excited about it. So again, education beyond the basic level. Rome had a fairly high rate of basic literacy, comparatively high for that period. But when you're talking about literacy in terms of literature and being able to read literature and do rhetoric, that becomes, again, restricted very strongly to the upper classes. More women were educated in Rome than were ever educated in Greece. But again, not to the level of they might read literature, but there was no point in them being educated in rhetoric mm -hmm. because that was for public speaking. And women were, by definition, excluded from public speaking. They couldn't do politics and they couldn't do law and they couldn't go be leaders on the battlefield. So what was the point? 
So the purpose of Roman education, and we know this because we have people who write about education. We have Quintilian and others who actually write about education. Right. And for them, the purpose of education is very explicitly to produce a moral citizen. So the purpose of education is moral, primarily. At least that's what the stated purpose of education is, to produce a moral and contributing citizen of Rome. And the reason it would produce a moral citizen is because by reading and reciting and memorizing and copying the best works of literature, they would be imbued with the moral qualities found in those best works of literature mm -hmm. of Homer and Virgil and before him Aeneas and the speeches of Demosthenes from Athens and the speeches of Cicero after Cicero or the speeches of the earlier orders. Mm -hmm. They would, of course, learn the content of those works, but it's never mentioned that they learn that. I mean, they must have. You can't read mm -hmm. all those things and memorize them without learning the content. But it's the focus is entirely on the moral qualities that you learn, the discipline of learning itself as being a moral good, mm -hmm. that it makes you a moral person, that you have to sit and memorize and learn. And then on the stylistic attributes of being able to turn good prose and make good phrases and be persuasive, which were tied very strongly in our writings to moral goodness as well. Only the good man can persuade. Right. Which was why there was also the tension again with the idea that you could teach rhetoric. They did it. And they really cared about learning it well. But there was this theoretical ideal that only a good man could learn rhetoric because if a bad man could persuade you with his words, how could you trust anything in the world? <laughs> right. Right. So for the Romans then, education's purpose, at least as stated, is to form the good elite leaders of the community. And again, there's no public education. There's no expectation that the general public will do anything beyond basic literacy, if that. And that is the stated purpose. Now, there's some pragmatic results to that, which were, of course, that they produced good politicians, produced persuasive speakers who could get elected. And there was a very sort of common curriculum. Everybody read the same authors. Hmm. And once Rome became a larger empire, they read the same authors in all the cities of Rome, in all the areas of Rome. Everybody who wanted to be elite would send their kids, would, would purchase good slaves to teach their kids the same works. Right. So it was aspirational, too. There was a certain amount of what social mobility there was at Rome. One of the ways of achieving it was having well-educated sons, uh, especially like freedmen would want to educate their sons. Horace famously says his freedman father had him educated like the sons of senators and equestrians so that he was kept in those, that kind of company. And that's why he could do as well as he did. And what it also meant was that there was a common language across the empire among the ruling elite. Hmm. And I mean that literally. <laughs> it's one of the reasons Latin was frozen right. in its written form so well is because they kept reading the same text. But also figuratively in that you could go anywhere in Rome and drop a quotation from Virgil and all of your peer group would know it. Right. And it was a way of signaling that you were part of that class, that you were part of that milieu, that you had the same reference points, the same general background. That may have not necessarily been consciously explicit, but it was a definite cultural point of the education. You know, whether or not people knew that that's what they were doing, it was one of the reasons that the education was so important, was it, it was a binding influence on that class. Okay, so that's classical education, very briefly summed up. As we move into the medieval period, sum up um, Western medieval <laughs> education purposes. Well, largely it was in the church. That's where the education was. So mm -hmm. you get educated if you enter the church. And if, you do, if you're not in the church, by and large, you aren't educated. This changes a little bit as you get into the later Middle Ages and you have aristocracy getting at least some basic level of education for mm -hmm. the purpose of reading, but not much beyond literacy. Mm -hmm. But if you were in the church, education and the work associated with that is in a, itself considered an act of worship. Right. Because the religion is based on textual sources. Textual sources. And so, that, of course, is a major difference from the classical yeah. world where while religious texts could be written down, it isn't textually based. Yeah. So reading isn't required for worship. Yeah. And so you would become a monk or whatever, mm -hmm. and you'd learn to read, and then you'd learn to write, and then you would spend many hours copying, because of course, this is how that textual source is transmitted, propagated, yeah. is tr transmitted, is through copying manuscripts by hand, laboriously. And, you know, mm -hmm. the Bible is a very large book. <laughs> um, and then the other writings and of the church all fathers. The other writings and... and yeah. 
So there's a massive literary output Mm -hmm. um, book production, Mm -hmm. which, again, is itself considered an act of worship to produce this stuff. So education, in a sense, continues to be a moral issue. Yeah. But it's not, there isn't that sort of civic element yeah. of, you know, like the oratory and, mm-hmm. and so forth. Mm-hmm. There isn't that part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. It is more divided off from the larger public mm-hmm. sphere. Mm-hmm. It is a moral duty, but it's a personal moral duty in a sense. You become a better person, yeah. but the point of becoming a better person is so that you will be saved and go to heaven, mm-hmm. not so that you will necessarily strengthen the communal mm-hmm. state. Though, of course pious monks and mm-hmm. and members of the church perform a service for the group at large. But there is also, you know, an element of higher education, even in medieval world. But it, mm-hmm. again, it's in the church. Mm-hmm. But I mean, this is when you have the, the trivium and the quadrivium, which are the sort of forerunners of our sort of bachelor degree and master's degree, essentially. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the seven liberal arts. Mm-hmm. And again, it, this is the foundation of our modern university Mm-hmm. System. I mean, the Oxford and Cambridge are founded and, and, in the and all the big, yeah. old Sorbonne universities. And, yeah. They're all medieval institutions, mm-hmm. late medieval, yeah, late, late, later medieval institutions. Mm-hmm. And so they would study beyond obviously basic literacy and book production mm-hmm. uh, topics like astronomy and mm-hmm. mathematics, mathematics yeah. and so forth. So, mm-hmm. so, and if I think about it in terms of audience, as I said, so it was very restricted by class and gender yeah. in the ancient world. In the medieval world, it's also restricted, but it's on slightly different lines. Yeah, it's it's a question of the estates, really. Mm-hmm. You know, which estate are you in? But the thing is that you could become a monk from almost any class. Yeah. And you wouldn't necessarily become a priest, but you could certainly enter the church mm-hmm. in some form, even from the lowest class. You moved into, into a new estate, but therefore education was, in a sense, more open to more people yeah as long as you were willing to vote to devote your life to the church yeah and it was also in some ways it's not exactly publicly funded but it was funded institutionally funded Mm -hmm. yeah as long as you were willing to Mm -hmm. vow eternal poverty and yeah devote your entire labor to the church (laughs) you could get educated for free now i imagine if you entered the church from a well-to-do family Mm -hmm. you are more likely to get into a good community Mm -hmm. and well and and i'm sure there was a division among the monks and among you know not all monks learned to write not all monks learned to to be scribes you know there's a considerable amount of manual labor to Mm -hmm. do as well because monastic communities are also Mm self-supporting so they're they do their Mm -hmm. they were labor and food and so forth so, so it's not that everyone could, but presumably if you came in with an aptitude, even if you were poor, yeah, you might end up you might end with up an education that you could never have achieved had you been a Roman of a similar yeah. background, for yeah. instance. And women in certain circumstances were also educated. Yes. And, and particularly early on, I've heard some speculations that, for instance, in earlier Anglo-Saxon England, there may have been a higher level of literacy among women than mm-hmm. men because of the women in, in the church. Right. And because there were lots of yeah. nunneries, but essentially female monastic mm-hmm. communities, and their learning was valued as it was in the male monastic yeah. communities. Yeah. Now, this changes somewhat after the Benedictine reform, and so there's n- not quite as much of that gender parity, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps in later periods, and I'm not as much of an expert in those, and, those and later other parts of and Europe. other parts of Europe and yeah. so forth. But at least at certain times, mm-hmm. there could have been quite high levels of literacy among women mm-hmm. in the church. And I should say that at Rome, of course, there were also women, and a little bit at Greece, but mostly in Rome, there were women who were highly educated. One of the classes that might result in getting high education was, in fact, the courtesan class. Right. Because, you know, a men of high education and literary bent might want sexual partners who were and mistresses who Mm -hmm. were also educated and elegant it was it was a sign of elegance and and refinement so it's not that there were no educated women we certainly have good evidence for educated women it's just as a group women were not educated and it was not necessarily a sign of high breeding and elegance for the most elite women to be educated and I think that, was, in a sense, is true in the Middle Ages, with a lot of variance depending on period and place. But among the nobility, I suspect there were periods probably when more women, even among the aristocrats, were likely to have better literacy mm-hmm. than men, just because they spent less time, oh, I don't know, out fighting, mm-hmm. you know, and 
might actually have the leisure time and not much else to do to become educated. Mm -hmm. So it probably depended on a lot of circumstances. So the purpose is largely moral, but also there is some emphasis on the idea that knowledge is a good. Yeah. Right? That increase of knowledge, because knowledge of the world is knowledge of God's plan. Yes. Yeah. And so to learn about the world, I mean, obviously the philosophers in the ancient world also thought that knowledge was good, mm -hmm. very much so, but they were the weird little exceptional people. Right. The vast majority of people were not philosophers and thought philosophers were kind of weird. In the Middle Ages, I'm sure lots of people thought that about the church too, but since the church is the ruling institution, yeah. it has prestige. Okay. And then we get to the period that Coach is covering. Yes. So, you know, as we get to, I mean, when, when we get the, the academic sense of coach, we're talking about the 18th century. Mm -hmm. But 18th even before that, century. you're talking about the Renaissance and yes. the revival of the revival. classical so, learning. E yeah. Okay, even before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have this revival of classical learning. It goes along with the Renaissance, a movement away from religious-centric yeah. learning. Mm -hmm learning for its own sake. Yeah, so this is what this is what I wanted to highlight mm -hmm. is that the purposes of education are changing yes. in the Renaissance. Right. Not necessarily the means of ed of education like methods mm -hmm. because all the way through education has been very very centered on literature, literacy, what we would call now the humanities. Right. Yes, there was mathematics, but most of the quadrivium and trivium are what we would call now humanities right. as well. And so that, and that doesn't really change in the Renaissance, though science starts, you know, what we could mm -hmm. call science sort of starts, but it's, it sees itself as coming out of the philosophical tradition with Aristotle, really. Right. Right. I mean, it doesn't, early Renaissance science, I don't think, sees itself as fundamentally different from literature or any of the other studies. Uh, it's still sort of authority based yeah. and yeah. tradition Natural based. philosophy. And, yeah. And only, you know, the experimental stuff and things like that, that comes later. Yeah, that that really starts in the 17th century, yeah. I guess, with Bacon and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The movement so towards forth. the Royal Society and the Royal the, that, Society. that period of the humanists. Yeah. yeah. So the purpose of education in the Renaissance then, <laughs> everybody who has a specialty in this period is going to be rolling their eyes at how incredibly simplistic, simplistic yeah. this approach is. <laughs> but just to say, Renaissance learning then also is restricted to the upper classes very much, right? Hmm. Renaissance learning is not a democratic process. There is no institution of public schools. Mm -hmm. Learning might be aspirational to a certain class because, of course, we have the rise of a middle class starting. Mm -hmm. There are people who will want to educate their children so that they can rise up into the sort of upper classes. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of them being educated to rise up is not so that they can get a better job. And this was something I really was trying to bring out yes. with my students yeah. about Rome. We'll come back to this, but, you know, obviously one of the purposes of higher education now is to get a job. Yeah. And in the Roman world, while on the surface, when I talk about the idea that they wanted to become better speakers and politicians and lawyers, it sounds like I'm saying they want to be educated so they can get a job too. But as I made my students realize, there's a really fundamental difference here, which is that they weren't paid for any of those Politicians were not paid. There was no salary. Lawyers were not allowed to be paid. Mm -hmm. And no senator or upper class man would dream of being paid in cash for a job. Mm -hmm. It would be degrading beyond even discussion. Now, that's not to say they didn't make money from being politicians. They made lots of money from it. They made money from being lawyers, but not directly. Mm -hmm. So when they were training for those positions, they were training to take on a role within the state that was their birthright mm -hmm. as members of the class, but not training for a job. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an important distinction. Yeah. So, for instance, you couldn't, therefore, come from a lower class, get the training and then get the job mm -hmm. because the job was yours because the class you came from. Right. The training was to equip you for the job you already were born for. And in the sense, that's true in the Renaissance as well, right? That the education is not job related. People who are doing that education are not doing it so that they can get a good profession. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I guess to some extent, though, I mean, there are maybe a little bit later than the Renaissance, you, you start to get into, you know, certain professions, you know, you become a doctor. Mm -hmm. But again, do you become a doctor by getting the education, becoming a doctor and then rising to that class because of your income? Or are you of a class who could become a doctor and therefore you decide that that's the training you're going to get and then you become a doctor? 
Do you see the yeah, difference? Yeah, I see the difference. Now, I, I agree that it is more, much more. It becomes you know, people a bit are more being, professional. Yeah, they're but... certainly being paid for jobs. Yeah. Now, we're talking now 18th, 19th century, yeah. maybe more. In the Renaissance, I think still most of the people who are doing, who are getting most of the education are the landed gentry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they don't have professions yeah. that they're paid for. Yeah. Right? I, I would say like yeah. Matthias, whatever his name was, Corvinus. with his Covinus, mm -hmm. with his, his library. Yeah. People aren't coming to that library so that they can learn how to do a job they're going to be paid for. No, that, no, that's yeah. not what yeah, that's yeah, about. Yeah. And the ac academy that's being refounded in Florence mm -hmm. is not for that. No, no. So that's not the purpose of education. I, I just want to point that out because mm -hmm. the Renaissance is, is still a very stratified society. Education is not really a route to upward mobility. I think that's sort of what I'm trying to point out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There may be individuals for whom it is. And over time, you know, you might get money from another purpose. You might be able to educate your children and they might be able to enter to that yeah. class better. Yeah. And there are certain professions. There mm -hmm. come to be certain mm -hmm. professions in the 18th and 19th century. That where, absolutely require. Like, like doctor. And where lawyer. You, and lawyer. Yeah. Where you could you could enter in a lower mm -hmm. I mean, you, you still had to have, obviously, as you say, enough financial support to be able to get the education. Mm -hmm. But if you did, you could then enter into a higher class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot more. Yeah. There's certainly a lot more fluidity to classes mm -hmm. in the 18th and 19th century. I mean, th that's a major difference between the Renaissance mm -hmm. and the sort of 17th, 18th, 19th century, mm -hmm. for sure. So that's a difference I want to point out in how education is being conceived of. For instance, when Erasmus Darwin is concerned with women's education yes and then later when the suffragettes are concerned for women's education one of the reasons they're concerned for that not the only one but one of them is because of the opportunities that education allows for women which wouldn't have been true 200 years before that mm. because how would it change what opportunity a woman could have because there's no job opening because you're educated Mm -hmm. So in the Renaissance, education is for education's sake. It's for refinement and cultural refinement. It's for elegance. It's for people just think knowledge is really cool. Mm -hmm. And maybe to a certain extent for moral improvement and self-improvement. And I think that was that was Darwin's main concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, main t that remains an important concern. For women, in, mm -hmm. in, especially in terms of women's education, was to make women valuable members of society. Right. As wives. Yes, wives and mothers. Wives and mothers. Yeah. There's and able where... to run a household mm -hmm. sensibly mm -hmm. and not, not be unable to cope, mm -hmm. not just be sort of dead weights on De merely society. Decorative, yeah. Merely decorative. Yeah, and that is, for instance, one of the reasons why upper class women in Rome were sometimes educated is because the more educated the mother, the better educated the children. Mm -hmm. So to fulfill their roles as wives and mothers... Mm -hmm. It was thought by some anyway that educating them was a way to educate, you know, to making them fulfill their role as mothers yeah. of good citizens. Yeah. That's their role as a citizen. Yeah. It's not for, in Darwin's case anyway, for emancipation in the sense we might consider no. emancipation yeah. from, you know, from dependence on, mm -hmm. and he's not trying to emancipate them from financial dependence on men, for mm -hmm. instance. And of course, the other thing to keep in mind is that even when you when you shift from kind of medieval education, which is really in, in the church mm -hmm. and is preparing for a career in the church to later scientific forms of education, mm -hmm. you can go to university and study chemistry. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you then go and be paid as a chemist. No, no. I mean, there are certain careers like doctor or lawyer, yeah. but there are many things that you would study in university that would not... That are not in any that way are not in any way career yeah. based. Yeah. And the only so, person who could go on and be a chemist is someone who's independently wealthy, wealthy and or, can play around yeah. with weird chemistry mm -hmm. stuff or you know it's something that you do in your spare time you're mm -hmm. you know a it's doctor a vocation and then, yeah and yeah. then you in your spare time you pursue your whatever scientific interests mm -hmm. uh, experimental interests that you might have that's what darwin was right he yeah. was a doctor yeah that's how he made money mm -hmm. but he dabbled in all kinds of scientific experimentation in his spare time inventing and so forth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so as we move into this 17th 18th 19th century education continues to be the purview of certain classes but it does start to move down the classes right mm -hmm. now the middle classes are expecting to get at least some education, some education. Yeah. and there's not really state funded or public education in any kind of way that we would not recognize it now but there are church schools mm -hmm. parish schools there are sort of charity schools, mm -hmm. there are boarding schools that run at a, at, you know, cheap enough rates that the middle class can 
mm-hmm. afford it. So you do end up with at least the primary and maybe secondary levels mm-hmm. starting to become an expectation. I'd say by the 19th century, you have the expectation that most people are going to send their kids to school for some period of time, that they are going to probably learn to write their name and do some basic sums. And more people are able to go, are going to, edu- to university. But still, even by the 19th century, I mean, who's going to university? How many universities yeah. are there yeah. and who's going there? And, yeah. and now I'm thinking mostly of England, but I think this is true across mm-hmm. Europe in general. Who's going? Well, it's the sons. Uh, the sons. Women are not going to university. Newnham College is late 19th century. Yeah. And they don't actually give full degrees. No, they, yeah, full degrees didn't happen until 20th 20s, century, I guess. It's 20, 1920s, I think, maybe, but I, I might be wrong. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's well definitely in the 20th, in the 20th century. century. Yeah. So sons of really your middle class, mm-hmm. and that class is sending their sons to school mm-hmm. to go to university, to become members of the church, officers, or general men of leisure, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it, like that. those are the careers. Mm-hmm. Or doctors and lawyers, and that's, you know, that's who's going to university at this point. So it's broader than it used to be, but it's by no means an expectation that everybody's going to go to university. And again, it's not really a huge path to upward mobility. Mm-hmm. You don't go to university so that you can get a better job. Mm-hmm. So that takes us maybe to the 19th century. And now education starts to move in the 19th century into a completely different setup. And now it really depends where you are, too, because you in North America, you've got public schools mm. and democratized public schooling a lot earlier than you do in England. Well, because it's the, there's no state religion. So yeah. there isn't the insti- there isn't one there the institutionalized church. church. Yeah. Uh, you also just don't have and you also don't have the wide separation of classes. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. The, I mean, of course, there's classes in North America, but not in the same way. Yeah. So the idea of like sending, you know, even in the 19th century, the idea that everybody, all the kids, all the kids, all the farmers, kids, all the everybody goes to school to like at least grade six. Mm-hmm. That is already happening in the 19th century in North America. And I think it's actually less likely to be true as universally and without pay. You know, you don't pay to go to school mm-hmm. um, in England at that point. But I think it's really in the 20th century that a lot of what we now think of that the purpose of education changes quite drastically. I mean, what is the purpose of education now? What is the purpose of university education now? It's a very vocational. Mm-hmm. Who is it open to? Well, in theory, everyone. In theory, everyone. It's gone through phases of different, so different levels of tuition. Obviously, in England, for instance, there was free tuition for quite mm-hmm. a long time. Mm-hmm. That opened it up mm-hmm. drastically. Mm-hmm. Now there's not, and here there is never was free tuition. Mm-hmm. It was always expensive to some degree. But I guess what I'm I want to drive at a bit is it is also very much considered a way to move for upward mobility. Right. Right. University from the beginning of at least of the 20th century, certainly in North America, was a route to upward mobility. Mm-hmm. You took the farmer's son. If he went to university, I'm I'm thinking now of Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> but if you can get that scholarship or pass that entrance exam and go off to university, then you could be a school teacher. Then you could be maybe get a job in as a clerk or a journalist or a, you know mm-hmm. like there's a, a now there's professions you can yeah, get. Yeah. And if you get those professions, you will make more money than you would, mm-hmm. and you will live in the city, and you will be in a different class, yeah. and you will move up. And your children, too, will move up in mail. Maybe you can own a house that you wouldn't have been able to own. It's transformative. Mm -hmm. And so education now has this very specific, pragmatic purpose Mm. because it can change your life in a way that, like, that was not true in the Renaissance. And I think that's a really important Mm -hmm. difference. And, and, And it drives a lot of, of course, the changes in how university has worked over the last 100 years. Because, you know, if that's a purpose of education... Whether or not it's the stated purpose of education, if that's one of the results of education, that drives what you're going to teach. Mm-hmm. Because if people are coming here to get better jobs, then they need and want education that will mm-hmm. get them better jobs. <laughs> and as the jobs change, the education has to change. And, you know, mm-hmm. and that, that tension that has continued 
and is obviously very strong right now between the idea of going to university to broaden your mind or to widen your horizons, to improve your moral condition. Even if now that me is a liberal humanist idea that you become a better person by you know seeing wider perspectives mm -hmm. and getting critical reasoning and learning how to read well and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. That's still essentially a moral issue. Mm -hmm. We're saying that people become better people if they go to university. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, lots of people come to university not to become better people, but to get a job. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's not venal of them. It's, it's definitely mm -hmm. one of the main purposes mm -hmm. of education and has been for the last hundred years. So I think that that's a, a real change. And it has to do, of course, with democratization in mm -hmm. general and and the rise of integrated education that women and men can go and the ongoing desegregation in terms of race, obviously, in the United States and elsewhere, where as the audience of those who are allowed to go to university has widened, hmm. the reasons they're going have changed. Mm -hmm. As long as it was restricted to a very small class who didn't, in a sense, have that much to gain from it, practically speaking, it could afford to be about moral improvement. But once it's open to a lot of people who have a lot of a lot riding on it and for whom it's a big investment of money and time they otherwise could spend on other things, the stakes get a lot higher, I think. The other shift, of course, that happens or that has happened is that we now think of education in terms of a public good. Yes. So education yes. as so that there is an educated, skilled populace mm -hmm. who can contribute to society. Right. Well, that is because though that's that's linked to the fact that education produces people who can do certain jobs. Yeah. And as the rise of capitalism has stressed, you know, changed the definition of good citizen to good economic producer. Yeah. From say, a Roman concept of a good citizen, which is somebody who was a good military producer, mm -hmm. you know, a good soldier, doesn't need an education, mm -hmm. or a good peasant, you know, a good mm -hmm. worker mm -hmm. who will, or a good contributor to church life mm -hmm. or whatever. But now, to be a good citizen, even if this isn't stated, basically you need to be an economic yeah. producer. Yeah. And so, yes, so that because education is seen as increasing economic production. Mm -hmm. It has resumed that moral role mm -hmm. in the community. And I think as a result of that, um, there's a sort of re-examination, and this sort of segues into what I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. a re-examination of the academic model itself. Right. If the goal is to produce a successfully educated populace, mm -hmm. are the old models for how we deliver that education suited to that? Or is it disadvantaging some segment of the population. Right. I mean, the, the sort of standard criticism, you know, of the, the sort of teacher standing at the front of a classroom mm -hmm. teaching to ideally to one student and then, you know, half the class bored because it's moving too slowly or lost because it's moving too quickly. Mm -hmm. And so only one student really has it at the right pace. Mm -hmm. Can we think of a better model than that? Yeah. Yeah, and also the tension between the other reason that public education is also seen mm -hmm. as a public good, the stated reason, some people are perfectly happy to state that all they wanted from humans is Our, economic produ yeah, productivity. They, they, mm -hmm. they see that as not something they have to hide. Mm -hmm. um, but others also see it as, you know, an educated populace votes well. Yeah. An educated populace makes good public health decisions. Yeah. And cost the state less, therefore. An mm -hmm. educated populace manages ma their life well. Manages their life well is a regulated populace. An yeah. educated populace mm -hmm. is a regulated populace. And that gets back to the idea that education provides morality. An educated populace in our standard education model is also a, a populace that has been taught to be obedient mm -hmm. and respectful of authority. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, my students, when I asked them what the purpose of primary education was, none of them said childcare. <laughs> But that's the primary purpose yeah. of public primary education in yeah. this in this country mm -hmm. and in mm -hmm. most Western countries and probably elsewhere. Is to allow the parents to, to allow go the parents and, to work. To work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To work. And and I'm I'm fine with that because I, I you know, I enjoy working mm -hmm. and I don't want to be a housekeeper. Mm -hmm. But obviously that that's not the stated purpose of it. No. It's not what comes home on the report cards. Mm -hmm. But basically that's what they're there for. And mm -hmm. they're also there to be socialized into a model of learning. Yes. That will then prepare them for the kind of learning they will do in secondary school yeah. and the kind of learning yeah. they will do in, as I said to my students, you know, I was standing one person in front of seventy people yeah. lecturing. 
I said, and I can rely on you not to throw things at me or interrupt me at every turn because you have been taught over the last 12 years of your life how to be good students. And while you may fall asleep in a corner, you're not going to leap up and beat me over the head. And mm -hmm. I don't have to hit you to make you listen to me mm -hmm. because you've been taught for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. And you can argue about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that is one of the major roles of education right now mm -hmm. uh, in the way that we teach. And it's not stated, but it's definitely mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So does our model fit our stated goals? Does it fit our unstated goals? Are there better goals? And that's really, I yeah. think, the questions you... In, does education now reach the audience we want it to reach? Is there a better audience? Is there a better way to reach that audience? That's why I wanted to kind of do this lead up, because mm -hmm. I think those mm -hmm. are the questions that need to be asked to look more mm -hmm. clear-eyed at what's the future of education. And I would say it probably meets the unstated goals better than the stated goals. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, I want to, you know, and this is probably going to sound surprising coming from me, but I want to take the optimistic <laughs> perspective mm -hmm. and say that we should be striving towards improving education towards the stated goals. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's optimistic. It's it, What it is, it's idealistic. Idealistic, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm all for idealism. I think, mm -hmm. you know, clear-eyed cynicism has its place. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I think it's also worthwhile trying to be idealistic. Yeah, yeah. And I think if there's any area of human endeavor in which idealism has an important place, it is in education. Mm -hmm. Especially as, and again, it, it, it may seem... Utopian. Utopian. But as, as we move technologically away from the difficulty of production, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. basic necessities... Yeah of yeah. existence yeah. there is a wider scope for innovation and enterprise and mm -hmm. grand ideas mm -hmm. and for that we're going to need people who are educated in in as broad a sense a broad a sense yeah. as possible yeah. so how does then youtube and podcast but you can focus on youtube mm -hmm. fit into what that is the role of that and in gen and in sort of broader sense the internet as mm -hmm. as an educational tool well the thing that I was thinking about is a sort of pair of YouTube videos mm -hmm. that um, discusses this, one by CGB Gray, Digital Aristotle, and a sort of what seems to be a, a, a kind of response, at least in part to that video in particular, mm -hmm. from Veritasium called This Will Revolutionize Education. So what Gray is sort of arguing for is that technology is coming to the point where it will revolutionize and change the way we are able to do education mm -hmm. and that we can do away with this model of teachers standing at the front of the classroom. Right. That the ideal model is something like why he calls it digital Aristotle. The ideal model is a situation where you have an Aristotle, you know, a tutor for one student, a right. one to one ratio. And this is the Aristotle to Alexander Al model Aristotle because Aristotle, of course, also taught by lecturing to classes yes. of students mm -hmm. just like to point that out that yes. was majority of what he spent right. his life doing and all of the writings that we have from aristotle are in fact lecture notes compiled either by him or by his students to a large extent right so just want to point that out yeah. no he's specifically <laughs> thinking of aristotle mm -hmm. tutoring, tutoring alexander. alexander that this is the ideal model but it's obviously impractical. We mm -hmm. simply can't have a one-to-one -one ratio mm -hmm. of human to human. But what he's suggesting is that a digital Aristotle will will soon be able to fulfill this role, that uh, the technology will be able to be the, the tutor for the student, and there'll be the role of the teacher won't necessarily go away in his view, but it will drastically change mm -hmm. from... From the purveyor of knowledge yeah. to a facilitator of yeah. directed learning. Mm -hmm. You can continue with that in a moment. I just, again, it just makes me laugh that he specifically chose Aristotle because given the emphasis on the moral teaching and purpose of education in the classical world, Aristotle himself would be horrified at the idea that someone other than a wise human would be the, the, the Aristotle, mm -hmm. right? Because how can you learn to be a better person except by learning from a person? I'm not saying this undermines what Gray is saying. Yeah. It's just to choose Aristotle as his model is so funny because A, Aristotle actually was mostly a lecturer, and also B, that he, he would have seen his role as being one of shaping the moral conceptions of by having him model himself on all the great you mm -hmm. know literary figures and all the rest of it. So it's just, it's just very mm -hmm. antithetical mm -hmm. to the idea. But that said, continue. Well... 
in response to this, Derek Muller of Veritasium mm -hmm. sort of goes to the history of the so-called technology revolutionizing Right, every, every wave of, every of wave. technology that was going to So it was first the radio would change mm -hmm. education and, you know, television would mm -hmm. change education and so forth. And, mm -hmm. you know, it sort of went on and, and on. And how much it, they haven't revolution, done so. yeah. And that they just never did, yeah. And so he sort of points out that there is an important role for the teacher in the educational model, though there is also a role for technology. Mm -hmm. And it's not that Derek is anti-YouTube. <laughs> since he's an YouTube, educational he's YouTuber. An YouTuber. But he, he does see that it, it can potentially have a role in the classroom. But the teacher is important part of the equation to inspire the students to learn. Right, right. Which, of course, Aristotle did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of other videos that I've seen on the the topic of education, you know, a number of TED Talk videos and so forth about the, the role of technology in the classroom and what it can and can't do. And one of the, the sort of takeaways that I got from that was that learning seems to be a kind of social process. Right. And so if you put a, a single student in front of a computer, they don't learn nearly as well as putting three or four students sharing a computer. Right. And doing the work together. Mm -hmm. And they will achieve remarkable things if you get a group of kids working together with mm -hmm. the technology. And I wonder, to some extent, even if that's true, you know, in the traditional model in a classroom, even if students aren't actually actively working together in a mm -hmm. group work, mm -hmm. group dynamic, just having students in a classroom sitting next to another student who's learning yeah. and having one person in the classroom ask a question and, you know, mm -hmm. even, even that, I, even I really that. do even think... Even without the technology. Even without the technology and also even without sort of, even in a very traditionally minded kind of, mm -hmm. not rote learning necessarily, but, you know, mm -hmm. sage on the stage kind of approach. Yeah. I think that would work, that works better with, and I know this from teaching myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've taught classes to two and three people. And while, yes, they get, boy, do they get my focused attention, but it doesn't work as well. Mm. Except, you know, certain like languages, it works really well. But like literature or something like, it really does not work as well as seven people. Yeah, yeah. It works better than 70 people, but there, there is, is a, a size. Like there's, there. there's yeah. a spot there. When you only have two or three people in the room with you, or one, it really doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there's a, there's a dynamic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, you know, I'm going to say something that many people may bristle a little bit at, but there's so much emphasis now on, against the sort of lecturing mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain point to that. that oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. That having more interactive mm -hmm. work is valuable. But I think there is still a place for not exactly the talking head, but the, the sort of the teacher as inspirer. Mm hmm. Right. The teacher as model for passion. Yeah. As inspiring your desire to learn, but also inspire as being a model for what it is to have learned. Yeah. I know when I went to university and a professor stood up and just seemed so smart mm -hmm. and to know so many things and to be able to make so many connections. And I was just like, I, that's why I want to do this so I can be like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I ever can be like mm -hmm. that, but like. That is that just looks like a great way mm -hmm. to exist, and I want to be like that. So they, they were inspiring me with the con, like their passion for the content because I loved it and that was great. Yeah. But they were also inspiring me with the model of yeah. the end result. Mm -hmm. This is what you can be like if you do the work that mm -hmm. you have to do. Mm -hmm. You too could be like this. The the ones who were most inspiring were also the ones that seemed the hardest to attain ever being like that. Like, yeah. and I'm never going to be like that. The ones who inspired me the most. I am never going to achieve that level. But in attempting to, mm -hmm. I obviously, you know, did more than I would have done mm -hmm. had I not had those models in front of me. Mm -hmm. And that was true even in univers in high school, frankly. Mm -hmm. There's also the social drive of wanting to impress your teacher, yeah. wanting your teacher to yeah. like you, wanting, you know, that is also mm -hmm. a key that I, I don't care about impressing computers. Right. I don't care if a computer thinks I'm an idiot for mm -hmm. writing something stupid mm -hmm. down. And goodness knows I care if I respect a teacher. <laughs> On the other hand, there's a value to being willing to be wrong. Yes. I think ideally there would be a space for judgment-free and personality-free experimentation where you could, you know, practice. Right. Without worrying yeah. that you were going to be made a fool of. Mm -hmm. And then there's a place for caring desperately what somebody thinks about what you say. Mm -hmm. Or at least caring a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that that then drives you to work harder. I think there's lots of room for the the technology to do a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that teachers now do. Yeah, and I think that is absolutely true. There's a lot of work 
that's done by humans that doesn't need to be done by them. Mm-hmm. But I don't I don't see that role disappearing. No. And I'm I'm sort of of two minds about this and I'm I'm not really fully decided on exactly where it lands. Mm-hmm. But I mean just from my own experience I know that a lot of the real learning happened when I was doing the work myself and mm-hmm. figuring things out myself. Yeah. So that's that's where it really happens. On the other hand, I really was deeply inspired by just listening to mm-hmm. intelligent lectures. Mm-hmm. So you might not have done that work on your own had you not been inspired not by been those inspired lectures, by for instance. So I think there is an important role for both. Mm-hmm. Um, and exactly what the model is and how you kind of incorporate all of that. I mean, I don't think the current system is ideal. No. Oh, no. And it's partly, I think, out of financial Mm -hmm. necessity. There's a lot of constraints mm -hmm. on the system that prevent Mm -hmm. a lot of idealizing, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, where does YouTube fall in that then? Because YouTube, at least at the moment, is not the Aristotle. No. Because it's not tailored enough. No. And what I think Gray was particularly thinking of was things like Khan Academy. Right. Which become which Which has a a YouTube component where Mm -hmm. you have videos, video lectures, mm -hmm. but there's interactive, there's a whole interactive website where you kind of do problems and kind of work through material. Yeah. Yeah. But then YouTube can also play that role that Derek was talking about. Yes. Of being the inspirational inspirational leaders. And I think to a large extent, that is the role it is currently playing. Yeah. That YouTubers. I mean, there are some courses that are very much about getting content across. Yeah. And, you know, there's a wide range of things out there. But there's a lot of educational YouTubers. That are just sort of fostering interest. Yeah. Yeah. And and trying to spark interest, trying to spark interest in either actual content or in methodology. Hmm. They're essentially saying, look, Here's how to do science. Mm -hmm. I don't care what science you do, but here's how to do science and why it's important. Mm -hmm. Follow along and be inspired to approach things in this scientific manner. Or here's how to do, you know, language or here's how to do, here's how to read literature and here's Mm -hmm. how to think about literature. Mm -hmm. Whether they think of it themselves or not, I think there's a lot of methodological Mm -hmm. modeling Mm -hmm. and inspiration Mm -hmm. going on. And, uh, And that's what a lot of the channels are for. And then mm-hmm. you get things like Crash Course, which are much, there's some of that inspirational stuff, but a lot of it's about getting individual content across. Yes, yeah, delivering content. You know, this yeah. curriculum mm-hmm. focused. And I think that's true in the podcast world too. Yeah. You know, I don't think, for instance, we do not think of ourselves as, curic- we're not curriculum based. No. Even if we do reference class work and things. Mm-hmm. I don't think that we're educating people towards a job. No. I'm sorry if that's why you were listening, <laughs> but I don't think we're going to get you a job. <laughs> Afraid you can't get your money back. I'm, I do. I am, do apologize if that ever crossed your mind. <laughs> um, but I don't think we ever gave that impression. But you know. But I'm hoping. I do hope that it inspires people to find it interesting and to think about to think about the world in in a connective way mm-hmm. and to think about a world in this kind of holistic way. And then there's also a lot of it is just people like to learn yeah. about the world. Yeah. And in a sense, we're then reaching towards that idealized moral quality Mm -hmm. an educated populace is a good populace Mm -hmm. and if we educate the world we are contributing to the moral quality of the world Mm -hmm. not to put too (laughs) (laughs) high-minded an aim on our shoulders but i mean i think you know if you think about stated and unstated purposes Mm -hmm. who is our audience well, theoretically, anybody that we know realistically, it's probably going to lie among people who have already done some education, mm-hmm. often in the fields we're talking about. But it is, you know, it's free mm-hmm. and it's accessible and the barriers to access are lower, mm-hmm. not absent, but lower. So, you know, is that a direction that education mm-hmm. should go? But neither YouTube nor online stuff of other sorts at the moment meets the, the getting people a job. Yeah. You know, and the social mobility, because there's no piece of paper at the end of it. Yeah. At the moment, there's no diploma, there's no proof of educational attainment, and there's no direct path to a job. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, online education, for the most part, does not fulfill that goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is really an important line, I think, that needs to either be crossed or society's goals for education have to change. Have to change, Either one one way or the Mm -hmm. other before there's going to be any real full integration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, kind of bringing it back to the idea of coach, Mm -hmm. maybe the, the model for the future is having, rather than 
teachers we have something more like coaches yeah yeah like you know, the team of coaches right to sort of work with you as you use the technology mm -hmm. to educate yourself in a sense mm -hmm. to carry you through so digital coaches digital coaches yeah but if the value isn't in the piece of paper itself, but the education mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. then that perhaps shifts a lot of the need for gatekeeping and yeah. and ma maintain maintenance of all the stuff that allows for mm -hmm. for um, proving that the piece of paper has yeah. worth and things like that. I mean, universities spend a lot of money in sort of their reputation, maintaining mm -hmm. their reputation. If they didn't need to do that, mm -hmm. they could run a lot more efficiently. All right, so we've decided we're going to be digital coaches <laughs> in a utopian society. Well, this has been a nice little break from the dystopia around us, yes. so, so I like that. I'd love to hear, though, if anyone has any ideas about that future of education mm -hmm. and those videos or other perspectives on this, especially if you do run or do educational online material mm -hmm. one way or another, or work in education, either way. You know, do what do you see your role as? What do you see the purpose of it? How does that mesh with what we were talking about? I'd also love to hear uh, all the criticisms of our very reductionist <laughs> trot through Western education over the last 3,000 years. Um, because <laughs> I know we've said things that were not right. So. Yeah, it was pretty unprepared. So it's just off the top of our head. <laughs> yeah. So anything, any comments on that would be welcome as well. And now we'll go back to making some more educational videos. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> For what purpose? Well, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.